I recently read about a, uh, a, a couple that has been married for 81 years. 81 years. Okay, 81 years, all right? They're both over 100 years old. Uh, they still recognize each other, okay? Uh, they met as teenagers, and they got married at the age of 21, all right? Now, according to the article, uh, they credit the longevity of their marriage to respectful communication and spending as much time as possible outdoors, okay? So that's the secret to a long marriage. Don't argue and play lots of golf, okay? Perfect, perfect, okay? But seriously, in, in other words, uh, they were careful about what they said to each other, okay? They might have disagreed many times, but they didn't argue. Uh, they kept their disagreements from becoming conflicts. Now, I've said this many times before, okay, but I believe there's a big difference between disagreements and conflicts. Disagreement is a difference of opinion, okay, where you uh, and the other person, you might think differently about a certain subject, but you're able to talk about it respectfully. Uh, you're able to listen to each other, uh, hear what each other has to say, maybe be open to changing your view, but you're both listening and you're both dialoguing, and it's basically you're both, it's you against the issue. You two on the same and the issues on the other side, and you might be trying to each other, but you're still on the same side, trying to figure out a solution to the issue. Okay, you're able to have a very civil, productive conversation, uh, and you can even agree to disagree at the end of the conversation or whatever, and still have a very healthy and close relationship. Okay, because again, it's you two on one side and the the, the issue on the other side. Um, it's you two against the issue, and you're just trying to figure things out together. Okay. I see most conflict, on the other hand, as a disagreement gone wild, okay? Uh, usually it's a result, not all the time, but usually it's a result of how one treated the other, okay? And now there are hard feelings against each other. So it's no longer you two against the issue, it's you two against each other, okay? And, and uh, there, there's, there's hard feelings, there's anger, there's, there's things that are said that continue to go do this downward spiral to hurt and eventually collapse the relationship if it's not dealt with. Uh, so healthy disagreement, I think, is a very good thing. Okay, It's how we learn, it's how we grow, it's how we learn about each other, it's how we grow closer to each other, and it's how we, it, we, we we're able to, to grow and expand our thinking. But I see conflict, however, as something that can oftentimes be very harmful, and oftentimes it's the result of someone sinning against the other. Not all the time but that's oftentimes what's the result. Now, some conflict is, in, is inevitable, it's necessary, okay? Such as when you have to confront somebody about a sin or something. That's oftentimes going to be very, very difficult. Or sometimes when you're sharing our faith, um, there's going to be conflict because we're trying to oftentimes tell them about their sin or tell them that the, their way of thinking is wrong and they might react very, very negatively. Um, but Jesus said he came to bring, not to came bring peace, but a sword. Uh, so I wouldn't avoid conflict at all costs, just the unnecessary one. Um, but sadly, conflict seems to be becoming more and more the norm in our society today, and uh, basically because we're all sinners. Uh, but it's something that we just seem to really elevate and to actually promote uh, and, and grandize as, as a, something that's actually something that's sensational. Um, and you know, we're about to enter a political season. Uh, the election is next year, and so you're going to just see conflicts. All the candidates jockey for position and do everything they can to make the opposition look bad and try to insult each other and make these accusations. And so you're just going to see the nation probably become much more polarized as we go into this next election. Um, there's all these other kinds of conflicts. We see conflicts in Ukraine and Russia. We see conflicts in the Middle East. Um, even here in the United States, you see a lot of racial conflicts. You see a lot of religious conflicts. You see church conflicts. And there's a certain attraction, like I said, we have towards conflicts. You know, conflicts gets flicks. You know, you, you, you don't see too many movies about a very happy marriage. Okay, there's always this about the conflicts that you see. So, so as followers of Jesus Christ, you know, we're, invariably we're going to be experiencing conflict. How do we handle those? What should be our motivations? What should be our attitudes? How should we process conflicts whenever we are in conflict with whether it be a person at home, our family, our marriage? our church, our workplace, our neighbors, our friends? Again, the Sunday school answer is go to God. But how do you go to God when you're in the midst of a conflict? What does that look like? Uh, do you pray that the other person will, will just give in? 
Or do you pray that, that it will just be swept under the rug and the conflict will go away and that you won't have to think about it anymore and you act like nothing happened? Or do you pray that you'll win at all costs? Well, the Bible gives us a good idea, or one good way, to process conflict as we go through it, through prayer. And let's all turn to Psalm 140. We just read that a little while ago. Uh, we have Bibles if you don't have one, so if you'd like to borrow a Bible, just raise your hand. The usher will give you a church Bible that you can borrow um, and just return it after the service. We're on page 522 in the church Bible, Psalm 141. And as you heard, we are on uh, currently up to, uh, I don't know, I'm not sure what number of sermons we've had, but we are on our emotional roller coaster series. And it's how, I guess it's really not commands, models from the Psalms of how to handle various emotions both the negative emotions as well as the good emotions. Um, and um, conflict, whenever you're involved in conflict, it brings all kinds of emotions and feelings in you. Uh, they, you could just see anger riling up in you sometimes, or it could be pride or, or vengeance or even hatred sometimes. And so um, we don't know what the situation that David was facing when he wrote this psalm, uh, but some think that it was a time when Absalom, David's son, King David's son, was trying to... Uh, take the throne away from David and drive him out of Jerusalem. All right, so that's, that's what uh, they think that maybe David was experiencing when he wrote this psalm. Now, I don't think most of us will be facing this sort of situation where someone's trying to drive us out of our position. Maybe you will. Uh, but as I was reading this, uh, I saw some really good principles in terms of how we should process and pray through conflicts. And maybe right now you're in the middle of a conflict with someone. Uh, this is a good way to pray and ask God for help. Uh, maybe you're having, about to have a difficult conversation with someone. You need to confront someone, or you need to have a very difficult conversation about something. Um, this is, uh, or you're going to discuss a difficult subject. This is a good way to pray as you go into that. Let's take a look. Verse 1. It says, O oh Lord, I call upon you. Hasten to me. Give ear to my voice when I call to you. Okay, so as David is dealing with whatever situation he's facing, he is calling upon the Lord, okay? And seems to have a sense of urgency here as he's asking the Lord to hasten to him. Kind of like, please hurry up, Lord, respond. I need you to respond soon, okay? Um, and then there's a couple of things for us to seek as we call upon the Lord whenever we're dealing with conflict. So verse 2. Let my prayer be counted as incense before you and lifting of, up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Incense, incense. Uh, I don't know if you've ever smelled incense. I'm sure you have. You know, if you've ever been to Taiwan, you know, might have gone by one of those temples or something like that where you smell the incense. Uh, it's usually associated here in the States with more Eastern religions, you know, like Buddhism and Hinduism. Um, but it was pretty prominent in Jewish worship as well. Uh, if you read the Old Testament, they had the altar of incense. So incense was a very big part of their worship. Uh, I was actually uh, back uh, about 10 or 15 years ago, I attended an uh, Anglican church. Um, I think it was Anglican very liturgical, and during the processional, okay, when they, their, their services, they have a processional. So at the beginning of the service, you know, everyone stands, and then the priests and the, 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 all the people who are involved in the service walk in and walk down the middle aisle, and they have these big banners and everything. It's very, very, you know, kind of like graduation, very pomp and circumstances type of thing. So anyway, you know, they, they actually walk around the entire sanctuary, and while they're doing that, one of the priests has this iron ball. He's not swinging around like this, but I mean, he, he has this iron ball, and in that iron ball is incense that's burning. And so there's smoke coming out of the iron ball, and he just waves it around. And he walks around the entire sanctuary, waving around this incense, and that smell of incense just wafts and, and, and permeates the entire sanctuary. And I thought it was really remarkable because, I mean, I've never seen that before, but it said to me, you know, that that's, they're actually engaging the sense of smell in worship. Because, I mean, that's one of the senses that we really don't engage when we worship here. Okay, uh, you know, and when, when your guy next to you, or gal next to you has body odor, that's not the sense of smell we're trying to uh, encourage here at, at church or in worship, okay? Um, uh, but it was noteworthy because we, we engaged pretty much all the other senses except the sense of smell. So that, that was very, very remarkable then. Uh, in the book of Revelation, uh, incense was associated with the prayers of the saints. Uh, the idea was incense was that it was a sweet, pleasing aroma to the Lord, and that would signify that the prayers were acceptable and pleasing to the Lord. In other words, as David is sowing here, he wants his prayers, and that we should want our prayers, to be something that the Lord delights in, something that the Lord enjoys. Is that something that you ever thought about as you pray? 
or everything that you ever aspire to in your prayer life, that your prayers would be pleasing to the Lord. Um, a lot of times, you know, we're not, I don't think about pleasing the Lord. I just want the Lord to please me prayers and give me what I want, right? That's oftentimes what prayer is all about, is me trying to ask God for things that I want. Uh, I've never really thought too much about, is my prayer pleasing to God? So how might you, your prayers be pleasing to God? Well, I, I see three ways. One is the attitude of your prayers, okay? When it's done with trust, humility, love, and a desire for the Lord, that would be pleasing to Him, okay? You see, you know, we keep saying over and over again, Christianity is a rela relationship, not a religion, right? God does not delight in mindless rituals. He wants a relationship of love that comes from our heart, okay? So how would you feel if your spouse or your significant other or your friend only spent time with you because they had to or they felt obligated to? That would not be a very healthy relationship, would it? Uh, but when they delight in your presence, they just enjoy being with you, that's what makes it special. And our Lord is no different. He wants us to enjoy and be pleased by being in his presence, okay? I'll hear about lifting up my hands as the evening sacrifice. That's, again, an expression of dependence upon the Lord as well as, as praise and worship. So does your attitude as you pray, is it pleasing to the Lord? Uh, the second thing about our prayers that pleases the Lord would be the content of our prayers, what you pray for. Okay, uh, 1 John 5, 14, uh, uh, John writes, And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now, for many of us, prayer is more about getting God to align to my will, right? God, this is what I want. Please give it to me now, okay? If you read the Lord's Prayer, which is really the disciples' prayer, so Jesus teaching his disciples how to pray, you know it's really not about me getting what I want. It's about me wanting what God wants, his will. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? And so it's still okay to pray for the things that you want, but it should be in submission to what God wants. And just like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he said, Lord, if it's possible, take this cup from me. That's what Jesus wanted. He didn't want to go through all that suffering if he didn't have to. But then he said, but not my will, but yours be done. And so that was his willingness to submit his will to the Father's will. Okay, so we have to make sure that the content of our prayers, that as we pray, submitting our will to the Father's will. And third, it's basically that we are dealing with sin. Uh, it says in Psalm 66, 18, that if I have cherished iniquity or sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. So when we, there's sin in our heart that we are not dealing with, uh, then that would not be pleasing to the Lord. So want to sure that you seek to have your prayers be pleasing to the Lord. Okay, and then verse 3. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over my lips. Okay, so the second thing is to pray for the right words. Okay, so when you're involved with a disagreement with someone, uh, it's so easy for our words to turn it into a conflict, right? Uh, how many times in the heat of the moment when you're disagreeing with someone about something, you said things that you regret? Okay? I'm sure it's happened to all of us. Because when you do that, the issue isn't really the issue anymore, right? It's not a conflict. It's, it's now a conflict because you said something or they said something that hurt or offended the other person, such as, you know, you always do this or you never do this. These are accusations that put the person on a defensive. Uh, other accusatory or pejorative statements that basically make the person defensive. And oftentimes the issue isn't the issue anymore because the other person is more focused on defending their honor, or defending their reputation, or just then, then discussing the issue of hand, right? You know, I'm sure you've experienced it. Just because what they said, you're not, this is war, right? This is war. Um, or words that belittle, or you're just dismissive of the other person's ideas, or their contribution, or their sense of worth. You know, I remember when I was uh, at my, I, I worked on the building, I was on the building committee, and we built a, a, a church building down there, uh, many years ago. And um, this is the first time we ever did anything. So we're all learning as we're doing it. And, you know, we, we, we put together a building and you know, it wasn't perfect. There were, there were some flaws to it, but, you know, we did the best that we could and it turned out okay. Uh, but I was talking with someone about some of the issues that we faced in our church. And he says, you know nothing about building a building. Okay, now, 
I was kind of insulted by that, okay? Because yeah, it was the first time we did it, but we had spent a year, a couple years on this building project. So I knew something about building this building, okay? So as he said that, the issue wasn't the building anymore. The issue was you insulted me. And I just feel the anger rising. I don't know if you ever saw Mystery Men. Anger rising. See the movie, you know what I'm talking about. It came out like in the 90s. Anyway, um, so, so I just felt this anger rising. And we, I wasn't really able to have any more conversation with him anymore because I was just so mad at what he had said. So I've been the receiving end of these sort of things. And I know that these kinds of statements really aren't that necessary. But sometimes we just say things. We might not think it's a big deal, but it inflames the situation. Um, and sometimes we might not even know our words hurt each other. I don't think that person knew that what he said hurt me. And I didn't say anything, so he never knew. I think to this day he doesn't know that. I was pretty upset at him. Um, I remember when I was at my, one of my previous churches, I was a choir director. And uh, there's a gal in a choir director. She was an alto. But she was very committed. She was very good. But she said she wanted to step down for a while. And I was fine with that because, I mean, she's very committed. So uh, as she was saying that and we were talking about it, I was just kind of kidding and saying, oh, man, where's your commitment? Man, where's your commitment? You're not a very committed person. Which is obviously a joke because she is one of the most committed persons that I know. All right? So I thought she was laughing along. Okay? But turns out she was actually hurt by that comment. And I had no idea until a couple weeks later, she came up to me and said, hey, you know when you said this, it hurt. And that she was stung by that. Now, my first reaction was to say, oh, come on, can't you take a joke? I didn't say that, but I was thinking that. But then I thought, okay, sometimes I need to watch what I say because you never know how that other person's going to take it. Now, obviously, sometimes you're not going to know that, right, until you find out here. But maybe I could have been a little more sensitive. Uh, and maybe I learned to lead, learned to I need to learn to be more sensitive in how I joke around. So that was a very, very important lesson for me, to watch my words. Um, and sometimes it's not what is said, but it's also how it's said that can stir up conflict. You know, the tone of voice as you say it, or the body language, or giving the side eye, or, you know, the eye rolls, you know, can easily communicate disrespect or belittling. And then when that happens again, the issue isn't the issue anymore. Now, I'm not saying that we can't be passionate in our disagreements or that we are, are to be emotionless when we talk about issues. Uh, it's that in our passions and our emotions, we're able to guard our words. So we ask the Lord, set a guard over my mouth, keep watch over the door of my lips, and help me to be careful about what I say. Because it's not sometimes we're just focused on, I need to express what I want to express. But there's also that the person needs to receive it in the way they need to receive it. And if it's not expressed in a way that they can receive it, then all bets are off. So you have to think, not only what do I want to say, but how, if I really want to get my point across, how can I say it in a way that the other person will receive it well and the communication will be complete? That's why we really can't do this on our own. And that's why we need God's help to really give us that sensitivity and wisdom to say the right thing the right way whenever we're in disagreements or in conflict. So pray that the Lord to watch your words and give you the right words to say, not only with those with whom you are in conflict, but those when you're talking to someone else about the conflict. You know, it's really easy to slander that person, to assume motive, to say just negative things about the person you're in conflict with as you talk to your friends about it, which just sometimes draws other people into that conflict. So watch your words and pray for God to help you watch your words. Second, pray for a righteous heart. Or third, pray for a righteous heart. Verse 4, do not let my heart incline to any evil to busy myself with wicked deeds in company with men who work iniquity and let me not eat of their delicacies. Now, even if you're able to control your tongue, okay, and you're able to watch what you say, it's not as easy to control your heart, your thoughts, your, your motives, okay? You might be smiling on the outside and all cool, calm, cool, and collected, but in your heart, you're firing bullets at the other guy or the other gal. Remember, Jesus doesn't just look at the outside. He, more importantly, he looks at the heart. Or in Matthew 5, 21 to 22, Jesus says this, You have heard that it was said of those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, You fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So basically, being angry with your brother or sister in Christ or anybody is the same as murder. That's the, there's an equation. Obviously, the effect isn't the same. 
obviously this is to say, well, if you think angry, you might as well kill them. No, don't think that way. It's just that, man, if I don't want to, I mean, if I don't want to sin, it's not just the external action, external heart. So as you pray for the right words, you need to pray for the right heart towards those whom you're in conflict. Jesus, remember, he said, what comes out of the mouth is a reflection of the heart. But evil actions and evil words from evil desires. So you must pray and ask God for that pure, righteous heart, especially when you're involved in a conflict. I know it's really easy to wish ill upon the other and you're in conflict or to think ways that you can get back at them or make them look bad or to think of things to say to win the argument. But even if you are unfairly treated or insulted, as far as of Jesus Christ, we are not to, to resort to the evil ways of others. In other words, as David prayed here, help me not to become like them if they are being evil or anything like that. I shared this before. Back when I was an engineer at Hughes Aircraft Company, I was working with a tech in a lab who was, uh, we were gluing on a cover for our night vision system, the, the Kevlar cover. And this guy was a very difficult really mean and gruff. And, and you, know, you know, you walk in the lab and he just looks at you with a sneer. And, you know, maybe he had gas, I don't know, but it just wasn't a very, very nice look, right? And so um, he was a really insulting guy. He's no fun to work with, okay? Now, now these techs, they, they really don't like the engineers looking over their shoulders. They just want to do their work, and they don't like the engineer saying, hey, did you do this, did you do that? So anyway, I was told, go down there and make sure they do it right. Um, so he had misdrilled some holes earlier on this particular unit. So that's why I had to watch him do it, because this was a, a out-of-spec uh, unit, because of the, he had misdrilled the holes. And so we had to do a redesign to get the thing to line up properly. <clears throat> so uh, he had a really hard time putting on those covers, okay? It took all night. Um, afterwards, we talked about the procedure. And he said, the reason this was so hard was because of the design of that wiring, okay? It was a bad design, okay? Now, he knew I was the engineer who designed that fix, okay? So it was a kind of an underhanded dig. And again, the reason we had to do that design was holes. So I was really tempted to say, well, the original design was fine, but some idiot misdrilled the hole. I was tempted to say that, but because it was very tempting to respond in kind. You insult me, I'll insult you. But God got a hold of me. I don't know how, okay, but somehow he got a hold of me. And so instead I said, well, yeah, we had to modify the design because the holes were misdrilled. Now, when I said that, he knew he was the one who misdrilled the holes. So he said, hmm, yeah, okay. And so, and we were able to move on. But if I had said it the first way, I would not be surprised if he tried to punch me, okay? And that would have not have been worth it, okay? So sometimes, again, we don't become like them. Uh, Jesus tells us to even love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute you. So whenever you're in conflict with someone, as much as you have that temptation to wish ill upon them, pray for that righteous heart that seeks God's best for them and the situation. I know that's hard. Again, that's why we need God's help to transform our hearts. Okay? Verse uh, 5. <clears throat> Let a righteous man strike me. It is a kindness. Him rebuke me. It is oil for my head. Let my head not refuse it. Okay, so the fourth thing is to pray for a humble attitude. A humble attitude. Normally when you're in conflict with someone, you assume you're right and they're wrong, right? Otherwise you wouldn't be in conflict because you'd all agree. For whatever reason, okay, uh, they can't see things properly. They're not seeing the things the way you see them. They're blinded by something. And sometimes you think, well, so they have ulterior motives, or their pride, or their personal agendas, or their desires. So they can't see things clearly. So that's why we're having this disagreement. That may be true, but at the same time, might you be the one who's in the wrong? Maybe you're the one who, 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 who has the ulterior motives. You're the one who's just prideful or has a personal agenda or has selfish desires. Maybe you're both wrong or maybe you're both right. You know, what I see here in this prayer, this section is as a real humble attitude, a real humble attitude. Um, if I'm wrong and someone corrects me, that's a good thing. Let my head not refuse it. Okay? So for many of us, okay, it takes a lot of humility to admit that you're wrong or that, that you're mistaken, or that you're misunderstood, or that, that you were sensitive. That's, that's the problem of pride, right? It can really blind us, easily blind us to the truth. 
because we just don't want to be wrong. We don't want to be shown to be wrong because for many of us that's embarrassing. Um, and so sometimes we just easily, we can just stick to our guns and continue the conflict just because of pride. Right? We don't want to admit that we're wrong or that our actions or words might have hurt others. Our pride just gets in the way of us admitting our wrong. You know, 1 Peter 5.5 5, uh, tells us this. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. He opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. The great definition of grace is that God, God is for you, on your side. You never want to be in opposition against God, okay, because he's God. He always wins. Okay, so if you're smart, which all of us are, you want God on your side. You want God on your side. Well, here's how. God is always on the side of the humble, but he's always opposed to the proud. Okay, now, all the time, and oftentimes, again, conflicts come out of disagreement because someone is just too proud to give way too proud to apologize, too proud to admit that what they said or the way they said it could have been hurt, uh, too focused on justifying what they said, why they said what they said, you know, or why they did what they did. So how open are you to constructive to different opinions? And that's, again, why some form of accountability is really important for Christian growth. You know, a righteous person, talked about here, someone who is seeking the Lord and is walking with him, who can speak truth to you. Listen, we all have someone like that in our lives. Um, I remember when I was in college and uh, I was asked to help out in this ministry with someone I did not particularly like. And so I turned it down. And I told the guy who asked me, uh, I don't think I would work well with this person. And a big brother in Christ, uh, who was a good friend, called me a few, a few hours later and gently said, you know, I don't think that was Christian of you to say it like that or to, to think this way. And so we had a good discussion, but I really appreciated his care, his gentleness, and his willingness to tell me what the Lord had looked on his heart. And so eventually I, I relented and I got involved with that ministry. And in fact, this, we still meet on Zoom regularly. Uh, I keep each other accountable. But I was so glad that he was willing to step out of his comfort zone and say, hey, you need to say this and you need to do this to have someone you can talk to in the midst of a conflict who can get their thoughts on this. Uh, people who would tell you what you need to hear, not necessarily what you want to hear. But always go forward with a humble heart. A humble heart. Lastly, verse 6. When their judges are thrown over the cliff, they shall hear my words, for they are pleasant. As when one plows and breaks up the earth, so shall our bones be scattered at the mouth of Sheol. Okay, so the, uh, the last one is to pray for God's protection and guidance. Pray for God's protection and guidance. Now, back in verse 5, uh, he said, let, let my, yet my prayer be against their evil deeds. So, so, you know, if I'm in a humble situation, I realize I'm still right. Uh, my prayer is that they would see they're wrong. It's not so much against them personally, but it's against what they're thinking or their wrongness, okay? Um, that they would be made right. Verse 6, again, this is very, very difficult to think, okay? Uh, for those who have an ESV, uh, there's a footnote uh, for that, uh, verse 6, right? When the judges are thrown over the cliff, uh, or verse uh, at the end of verse 7, there's a footnote, and it says, meaning of the Hebrew in verse 6 and 7 is... Okay, it's very difficult to say. Um, but as I studied it, here's what I think it means, okay? And this is not gospel, okay? So, so take it with a grain of salt. Verse 6 could be translated, okay? Um, <clears throat> when they are thrown over the cliff by their judges... Okay, so being thrown over a cliff back then was a form of judgment. Okay, people, rulers, sometimes being thrown over a cliff uh, to their death, that was a form of judgment. Um, so when they are thrown over the cliff by their judges, um, verse 7, uh, no wait, verse 6, then they will hear my words for they are pleasant. Uh, the, the opposition will listen. Once, they're, once they are thrown over, once they are judged for what they did, then they will listen to what the psalm is saying. Realize that he was right. Okay? That's not happening now in verse 7. As, as when one plows and breaks up the earth, so shall our bones be scattered at the mouth of Sheol. The idea is now he's in the right, but he's on the verge of defeat. All right? 
it looks like they're going to be destroyed, even though they're right. Okay, now I don't think we'll face as dire a situation where we think we're going to be destroyed. Uh, but oftentimes in conflict, it looks like things are not going to work out. Okay, ideally, if neither side changes their mind, you can agree to disagree and move forward, okay, and move on in unity. But sometimes the conflict is so strong that the relationship is ruined, okay, and, and there's a lingering of hard feelings. Sometimes there's a divorce in the family, or sometimes, you know, the friendship is lost. Uh, sometimes people will leave the church because of it. Sometimes the church will split. Uh, sometimes it's just continuing hard feelings against one another. And that might not be life-threatening, but that can be very devastating to a family or to a church or to people when things like that happen. But despite the dire situation that the psalmist finds himself in, what does he focus on? Well, verse 8. Bones might be scattered at the mouth of Sheol, but my eyes are towards you, O Lord, or God. In you, I seek refuge, not defense. His eyes are focused on the Lord. While the opposition's intention is to hurt and destroy, David's not focused on the impending doom. He's focused on the Lord. And I shared this before, I think a few weeks ago. You know, there's a big difference between a gaze and a glance, right? A gaze is a focused and intense look, and a, a glance oftentimes, in difficult situations, we gaze at our problems and we glance at God. Right? We're so focused on the problem at hand and we, we pray very quickly, God help me, but we're so focused on the problem. Uh, but David is different. His gaze is upon the Lord and he glances at his problem. He seeks refuge, it says here in verse uh, uh, 8. In you I seek refuge, lead me to the Lord for protection. He says in verse 9, keep me from the trap that they have laid for me and from the snares of evildoers. Okay? He's asking the Lord to keep him from these traps of the opposition. That's guidance. He's asking for guidance. And then let the wicked fall into their own nets while I pass by safely. He's just asking again for that protection. So as you go to the Lord and you gaze upon him in the midst of these conflicts, instead of focusing so much on the issue, the person, you know, gaze upon the Lord. Pray with that dependence. Remember his promises and focus on them. Memorize them. Recite them whenever those anxieties about these conflicts come. And then seek his guidance through his word. And remember that he's right there with you. We sang about that before. Emmanuel. With you. So continually interact with him as you deal with this problem. You know, we have something that David really didn't have back then. And that's the Holy Spirit indwelling in us. Okay. Back in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was present, but he came upon people and would leave them. His indwelling back then wasn't permanent. But when Jesus came, he promised the Holy Spirit would be permanent. He would come and indwell all those who repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We all, as followers of Jesus Christ, have the Holy Spirit. For even though the Holy Spirit is in us, we ought to yield to the Holy Spirit's leading. Okay, that's what I would call the filling of the Holy Spirit. Allowing the Holy Spirit to lead and guide and then following as he leads. That's the filling of the Holy Spirit. And this is one way to do that, especially in conflict. As you yield to the Holy Spirit, praying that your prayers would be pleasing to the Lord. Praying for the right words. That the Holy Spirit would give you the right words to say. Praying that the Holy Spirit would give you a righteous heart. Praying that the Holy Spirit would, and you would yield to having a humble attitude. And then praying and guidance as you go through these things. This kind of prayer, actually, not just when you're in a conflict or about to go into a conflict or dealing with one, it's better to actually be prayed constantly so that you're able to avoid those unnecessary conflicts altogether. That when you are in the midst of a disagreement, that these thoughts and these prayers would be already ruling in your mind and in your heart, so that you're able to naturally, through the hope of the Holy Spirit, guard your mouth to act righteously, to be humble, teachable, and correctable, and to experience the Lord's protection and guidance through the process. So this is a great prayer to start even now, wherever you're at. Maybe you're in the midst of a conflict right now. Maybe you're about to have a difficult conversation. This is a great prayer to be going through to help you set your mindset to be what God wants it to be as you go through it. But maybe you're doing fine right now. You're not in any conflicts and everything's at peace. 
Uh, still a prayer to pray so that when these times come, your mindset is right with God. Okay, so and what is God saying to you this, this morning as you looked at David's God as he is in the midst of a conflict? Maybe, again, you're in a conflict with someone right now. Maybe you see a conflict riling up. Maybe you need to confront, or maybe you have to have a difficult conversation. Maybe it's a good time to just pray through this and see where God brings you. As you interact with family members, as you interact with uh, friends, maybe, again, things are at peace and everything's going well, this is still a good prayer to pray. If God would be guiding you, giving you the right attitude. So just pray through this prayer. With the Lord right now. Wherever you're at. Father, we thank you so much for these psalms, which gives us different ways to process the various emotions that we face. And Lord, I see this as a very helpful psalm, especially when it comes to conflicts, disagreements, <clears throat> just interactions with others. <clears throat> Lord, as, as followers of Jesus Christ, you call us to be people who are to be at peace with all men, as much as it depends upon us. And Lord, it's so easy for us to bring about unnecessary conflict through our words, through our attitudes, through our thoughts. But Lord, I just pray that you would help us to be what you've called us to be, to really be able to humble ourselves, to really seek, Lord, what's more important than me being right is the unity of the body, especially here in our church family. I pray that we would see each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. We are on the same team. Our common enemy is not one another. Our common enemy is the devil, Satan, and evil. We are serving together for the gospel. And so, Lord, as we, which is a manifestation of this unity that we share in Christ's body, Lord, I pray that that the symbolic observance would be grow, a growing reality here in our church. We would be people who really watch our words, people who watch our hearts, who act righteously, who are humble. As a result, we experience your protection, guidance, and we pray prayers that please and honor. So work in our hearts. Lord.